Hello, students. We were hoping you could see our beautiful faces, but my webcam isn't working. Bad webcam. This is Miss Cavito. And Mr. Stasharowski. And Mr. Novick. Lurking in the background. And we want to talk to you about Tinker versus Des Moines. Uh, also known as the armbands in school case. That's how I always remember it. Um, so what is the background of this case? Um, Mary Beth Tinker was an eighth grader in 1965, and she and five other students, including I think one or two of her siblings, mm -hmm. um, wore black armbands to school uh, in order to protest the Vietnam War. They were um, hoping to send a message uh, that they preferred peace rather than continual conflict. Um, the school got wind of this plan and this protest before the students did it, so they immediately put a policy in place saying that this would result in a suspension. The students did it anyway, and so they were suspended for violating the this rule. I'm sure many of you can uh, relate to uniform policies and violating uniform policies and things of that nature. Um, in this case, uh, the ACLU, not the ALCU, that's not a thing. It's not a thing. ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, approached the Tinker family to bring a suit against the school on First Amendment grounds. Um, that this was violating the students' freedom of expression and that wearing their armband should have been protected speech. Um, you want to talk about the holding in this case, Mr. Nevick? Putting you on the spot. Um, the symbolic speech was found to be constitutionally defended, but the Supreme Court established a test for which they analyze symbolic speech. The message has to be clearly conveyed and easily understood. So wearing any random piece of clothing and saying it's protected under free speech doesn't cut it. It has to actually be symbolic speech. Nice. Ooh, we're going to come back to that in a little bit. Um, the holding overall uh, said that the First Amendment does apply to public schools and that um, speech that might cause a controversy or discomfort um, is not enough of a reason for that speech not to be allowed in school. So here's a little quote for you from the majority opinion, which was written by Chief Justice Abe Fortas. Neither students nor teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. So why did she do this? It's a good question. Um, so the motivation uh, for Mary Beth Tinker to do this is really interesting. Um, I just got a chance to listen to her speak about this um, as a webinar that I sat in on a couple nights ago. And um, it was interesting. She talked about how she was in eighth grade when she did this. Mm -hmm. uh, she was 13. Um, she went through five periods of class on the day that they wore the armbands. And her favorite teacher was the one who, at the end of the day, sent her to the principal's office. And the principal took, told her to take her, take her armband off. And she did. And she was so mortified and embarrassed and ashamed that she had done this. And if I remember correctly, she was also following the lead of some older students who were also doing this. So she didn't just come up with this out, you know, on her own. There were some high school students who were doing a similar thing and she decided to participate uh, in their action. Yes, good point. And she also didn't think of this um, kind of out of the blue either. This was, um, this idea to do this protest came from kind of her family background and some of mm -hmm. her family's values. Why don't we let her talk about it a little We bit? should let her talk about it. Here's Mary Beth in her own words. By 1965, when the Vietnam War was building up, there had been about 1,000 U.S. soldiers killed that Christmas. Every night on the news, there would be a body count by Walter Cronkite, the reporter. And it was very upsetting for us kids. I was a very shy girl, and so I wasn't some rebel um, protester, but I really believed in the messages that we had learned in church, which is that peace and love were very important. And so when some of the older kids started talking about speaking up about the war and the images, the horrible images that we were seeing on TV of the war, um, I thought maybe I should try to speak up too. When the older kids just decided to wear simple black armbands um, to school like this, and they said, come on, you know, let's, we can do this. So I thought, well, maybe I will try. And so that's how I got involved with this very small action that turned into a very big case at the Supreme Court. It's interesting, and listening to her talk about it, it almost kind of sounds like she was peer pressured into this protest a little bit. I, I got that from, from her video as well. Um, but uh, what I also learned from listening to her speak on this webinar was that um, her family had been really involved in a lot of civil rights activism before the Vietnam War even started. Um, her father was a Methodist preacher, and her um, family had actually almost been run out of a previous town that they had lived in because her father had um, 
tried to support integrating a public swimming pool that had a big no blacks allowed sign up on it. And, and he ended up losing his church and kind of they mm. almost had to lose uh, leave town um, I, after that incident. It, if I can just point out, uh, mentioning that the pool was not yet integrated, just kind of should reinforce that she's taking these actions at a time when integration is not the standard across the country at this time. So any sort of civil rights activism, be it uh, integration or uh, anti-war protests, is a big deal to a large portion of the country at this time. Yeah, really good point. Um, she also, while she was so embarrassed about having been suspended uh, initially by the principal um, the first day that she wore the armband, if you see photographs of her during the court case, she's wearing it the entire time that this goes through the Supreme Court. So um, it was interesting to hear her talk about how you don't have to be the most brave, courageous, outrageous, big personality type of person in order to really make a substantial change in the legal system. Mm -hmm. You just have to very, you know, firmly stand for what you believe in, um, even if it maybe makes you terribly uncomfortable on a personal level. Believe in something and then stand up for what you believe. Yep. So she talked a lot about um, that family background and the kind of community support uh, for civil rights, um, civil rights activism in general. And she also really pointed out the role of journalism and just bringing the facts of the mm -hmm. Vietnam War to light during this time period and inspiring her and um, other young people to, to really decide what they wanted to believe in and what they wanted to support. Yeah. Th this war is being covered to a degree that no previous war had really been covered. Uh, previous wars, World War One, World War Two, had all been um, covered by journalists and they were sending back reports. Uh, Vietnam was one of the first wars where we actually saw uh, reporters embedded with uh, the troops. We were seeing video taken when these uh, journalists were over there and all those pictures and videos were being sent back home and Americans were experiencing it almost firsthand. Yeah. Um, the last thing that motivated her was uh, another Supreme Court case that came a couple years earlier um, and also had to do with students expressing their opinions or their feelings in school. The court case was called Burnside versus Byers, and it took place in Mississippi, a town called Philadelphia, Mississippi, a couple years earlier in 1963. This and is the Buttons case, right? This is the Buttons case. And um, I'm going to show you a little bit of video from that time period just so you have a sense of kind of what the context is there. So I'm going to turn the sound down on the video a bit, but um, this is uh, news footage of a civil rights march in Philadelphia, Mississippi, which was the town where three civil rights um, workers uh, were assassinated in mm -hmm. 1963. They were uh, registering uh, African Americans to vote and they were killed essentially by white supremacists who were opposed to integration. Um, students in this community after this march um, to kind of keep the momentum going and, and um, also stand up for what they believed in ended up wearing little tiny buttons, uh, like you know, no bigger than a quarter mm -hmm. on their um, shirts at school and the buttons said, one man, one vote. Um, and they were similarly suspended um, and their court case also was taken up by the Supreme Court. And in that um, instance, the court decided that uh, students were allowed freedom of expression as long as it wasn't disrupting the school environment um, or creating any sort of violence inside the school. And nobody wearing a button was really distracting anybody else. Um, and so that was what allowed Mary Beth Tinker and uh, her siblings to kind of make the argument that the armband was not enough to uh, cause the reaction that the school had. It wasn't disrupting the learning environment. Right. So this case is setting the precedent and then the Tinker case builds upon that precedent. Exactly. So now that we know a little bit about the background of this Tinker's case, uh, Ms. Guido, can I ask you, why do you think this is a landmark case? Um, I think for two major reasons. One is that it's a, um, a court case that has to do with the rights of children, essentially. Um, so much of what we hear about in the law pertains to adults making kind of informed or at least thoughtful decisions, um, whether or not those decisions are, or thoughts are right or wrong. Um, but I think this is an interesting one because it really has to do with people who um, really have no other way of letting their voice be politically heard sometimes in America, other mm -hmm. than maybe to do something like protest. Right. Um, so I think it's really important for giving young people um, an opportunity to let their voices be heard, mm -hmm. whether it's through something as simple as maybe wearing an armband to school. Mm -hmm. I think it's also kind of, um, we see it even playing out today, 
Uh, we have a 16-year-old uh, student from uh, Norway, I believe it is, who has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Oh, yeah. Uh, because Greta of Gunberg? Greta Gunberg, I believe is her name, yeah. Uh, for her uh, actions in trying to um, protect the environment. Uh, and so we see, again, students who aren't technically citizens in the same way that <laughs> adults are, uh, but are trying to exercise their rights and trying to express those rights in some way. Yeah, it's a good reminder that rights apply to everyone. Correct. Um, I also think it's interesting because it provides the basis for a lot of the school policies that affect our students today. Like when students at Northtown like to complain about the dress code or dress downs or why can't I wear ripped jeans or whatever, a lot of the justification for why we have the rules in place that we have mm -hmm. actually go back to some of these Supreme Court decisions. If you're not disrupting the learning environment mm -hmm. or distracting other people from learning or creating a uh, potential for violence or violent controversy, um, then, then you should be allowed to wear what you want. But that's been that's open to a lot of interpretation, that is very um, true. and the wording of that uh, Burnside versus Byers case ended up giving schools a lot of wiggle room to maybe put policies in, in place that maybe are maybe not so much following the spirit of the decision of right. a case like right. the Tinker case. Anything else you want to add? No, I think I think we covered it pretty well. All right, thanks, guys. Thank See you, you. later.